magic son of a bitch eats a dick. Hey guys, Ryan and Ryan here, and season two of Stranger Things is filled with a ton of Easter eggs. And lots of 80s pop culture references that we can't wait to get into. So many, in fact, that you'd probably get sick of our faces if we tried to name all of them. Instead, we're gonna share our absolute favorites from each chapter of Stranger Things 2. Now, we're gonna steer clear of all the music references yeah. because every episode is packed with lots of great music from the time period, and that's just a little bit too much to cover right here. But having said that, if you guys have any other ideas for Stranger Things Season 2 that you want us to cover, let us know in the comments below. All right guys, there's two Ryans here. We're talking Stranger Things Season 2, and there's two things you gotta do. One, subscribe to Universe for more of Stranger Things, including our Season 2 review and favorite moments. And two, click the link in the description below to enter our Stranger Things giveaway. We're giving away two pops, Hopper and my favorite, Dustin. Without further ado, let's jump into Chapter 1, Mad Max. All right, the title of the opening chapter and Mad Max's high score on Dig Dug is an obvious callback to George Miller's 1979 post-apocalyptic thriller starring Mel Gibson. Of course, by 1984, the film already had a sequel with The Road Warrior, and a year later, Beyond Thunderdome would hit theaters. We don't need now the reintroduction of all of our favorite characters in the series starts with an arcade that is totally, totally a callback to Tron, which opens at Flynn's. The first video game we see the boys playing is Dragon's Lair, which was an animated game that ran off of a laser disc. It was created by animator director Don Bluth. It was a quarter eater. It was terrible. The controls were rough, and the anger that those kids are expressing is genuine. James Cameron, The Terminator is on the theater marquee, and it premiered on Friday, October 26, 1984. Murray Bauman tells Chief Hopper that he thinks Eleven is a Russian spy. Sounds like a lot of conspiracy theorists during the Cold War. The paranoia of Russian invasion reaches theaters with 1984's Red Dawn, which is also an 80s high school drama. Will visits Dr. Owen's office and is asked what his desert island candy would be, and it's a no-brainer for Joyce and Will. Reese's Pieces? Good call. Good. Good call. Which is a certain extraterrestrial's favorite as well from 1982. This is technically sort of a season one thing, but the lab's architecture itself, the choice of that building is very reminiscent of a lot of the 80s horror, especially that came out of Canada by David Cronenberg, yeah. and the use of that sort of like modern cement style, opaque architecture. And you can find that throughout that period. Now, the other thing that comes in is we start getting the beginning of a lot of references to the Alien a series. A whole bunch of references. In this case, it's just starts off with the flamethrowers, and yep. flamethrowers are huge in the Alien series, and there's this is no exception. They're right there, they start burning out the nest. We also get an iconic recreation of a scene from Close Encounters of the Third Kind when Will is opening his front door, and he sees the upside down right on his doorstep, and the mind flare out there in the distance. In Chapter 2, Trick or Treat Freak, we get another E.T. callback as Eleven uses a bed sheet to dress up as a ghost. Oh, Jesus. Ghost. Yeah, I see that. One of the most obvious references to the time period is the boys being dressed up as the Ghostbusters. That film debuted in the summer of 84, so this was a perfect costume for the party. And that, of course, leads to a very funny argument over who gets to play the Bill Murray character, Dr. Peter Venkman. What's wrong with Winston? He joined the team super late. He's not funny, and he's not even a scientist. Yeah, but he's so cool. If he's cool, then you be Winston. What? Bob is Count Dracula, who shares a dance with Joyce. By the way, Winona Ryder was in Bram Stoker's Dracula. Max scares the hell out of the boys wearing a Michael Myers mask from Halloween. And at the high school kids' party, there's just costumes left and right. Tommy, the biggest jerk from season one, is wearing a Cobra Kai outfit from The Karate Kid, proving even more that he's just a jerk. While we're finding our way through that party, we also run into a guy who's dressed up like John Belushi from Animal House in the toga outfit. Steve and Nancy reenacting risky business, perhaps because she's a huge Tom Cruise fan. Hawaii's own Magnum P.I in someone doing the robot in a Nixon mask, which still falls short of the best use of a Nixon mask. Yep, point break. I'm not a crook! <laughs> Finally, when Eleven is flipping through the channels without a remote, just with her mind, that shot from behind her with the static TV is very Poltergeist, a 1982 classic. She also ties a bandana around her eyes, which is another nod to the Karate Kid. Chapter 3, The Polywog, gave us some serious Gremlins vibes throughout. Just like the Mogwai, Dart looks extremely adorable, but soon they turn into terrifying monsters. Neither of them like bright light, and feeding them is a 
horrible idea. Get out of my kitchen! <laughs> The aforementioned Dart is a reference to D'Artagnan, one of the main characters in The Three Musketeers, also a favorite candy of his. D'Artagnan. I'm gonna call you D'Artagnan. In another Ghostbusters nod, Dustin has a certificate of anti-paranormal proficiency on his wall, a large E.T. toy, and a D&D action figure for Odious Ogre, which came out in 1982. Chapter 4, Will the Wise, that Steve vs. Billy showdown on the basketball court felt a lot like Teen Wolf, but that didn't come out till 1985. Eleven opening up the basement door reminds us of the Evil Dead's fruit cellar. Once in my fruit cellar! And while searching through the boxes, she finds some evidence of Hopper's past, New York and Vietnam. That may explain why he's so well versed in Morse code and setting up trip wires around the cabin. Oh, and did Hopper's investigations into the dead crop fields and underground tunnels remind anyone else of Tremors? Not only does Dart remind us of the gremlins, but also the xenomorph in the original Alien. Remember from the first Stranger Things, the monster hatched from an egg and attached to Will's face. He coughed up a smaller creature that also grew up into a cat-eating monster. The young demo dog also sheds its skin before it can grow larger, which is very similar to Alien, where the recently bursted chest burster sheds its skin before it can grow into a full-sized alien. After he's possessed, Will's frantic drawings from his memories recalls Spielberg's close encounters of the third kind, when everyone affected by the extraterrestrial visitors would create drawings and sculptures of Devil's Tower. Chapter 5 Dig Dug opens with even more Evil Dead influences. First, that shot of the porch swing swaying in the wind, then Hopper getting wrapped up in some iconic supernatural vines, which we saw in a much more horrific version in The Evil Dead, and finally Dustin gearing up to take on Dart. This one we really enjoyed. Bob comes over to help with decoding the monster map and has a question of his own. What's at the X? Pirate treasure? <laughs> Bob, no questions. Okay. That's of course a playful nod to Sean Astin's role as little Mikey from the Goonies. Yes, he's all grown up, but he's still looking for hidden treasures. Now, in another major callback to aliens, Hopper starts using his cigarettes as sort of breadcrumbs to find his way through the hive, which is basically the same as when Ripley went to save Nuke from the alien hive and brought flares to drop on the floor. In fact, there's one shot where Hopper drops a cigarette on the ground and steps on some tentacles that looks just like the shot from aliens. In the scene in the Hawkins lab where they're testing the dirt, they find that it reacts to stimuli, and that's very much like the blood test in John Carpenter's The Thing. Eleven's origin story has a lot of influence from Stephen King. Firestarter also follows a little girl who breaks free from a mysterious government agency with her supernatural powers, although Eleven uses telekinesis, not pyrokinesis. Lucas's sister Erica steals one of his He-Man toys. That show was on TV from 83 to 85, so it was pretty popular among 80s kids. A hat tip to Indiana Jones, literally, as Hopper refuses to leave his hat underground. Chapter 6, The Spy. This isn't a Stranger Things first, but we have Steve and Dustin walk on the Stand By Me train tracks. Here they talk about girls and hair products while leaving a trail of chum for Dart, so it's pretty much like Jaws except on dry land. At least we know Will is a Jaws fan. When Nancy and Steve stay over at Murray Bauman's, they share a romantic reenactment of something we saw in the Temple of Doom. Trust issues. <laughs> Trust issues. I'm conceited ape. I'll tell you in the morning. I can't believe it. He's not coming. She's not coming. Indiana Jones! This is one night you'll never forget! At the lab, Paul Reiser more or less reprises his role as Carter Burke from Aliens. The meeting where Joyce is trying to explain what is happening to Will is basically a remake of Ripley's hearing with the Wayland yutani Corporation from the beginning of Aliens. And that's not even the end of the Aliens references in this chapter. Dr. Owens, watching the soldiers die on the monitors who have gone into the nest, is straight out of Aliens. Furthermore, the radar and the beep sounds are just like Aliens. Chapter 7, The Lost Sisters, is a bit of a departure from the rest of the season as it takes us out of Hawkins and introduces us to another group of characters. Instead, it feels like a mashup of the X-Men, the Warriors, the Empire Strikes Back, and Hook. You're gonna start losing things, starting with those pretty little locks of yours, yeah? I bet you don't even have a fourth grade reading level. Immortal suck navel. Well, maybe a fifth grade reading level. <laughs> 
Eleven showing up with a total makeover is also a further reference to The Breakfast Club and Ali Sheedy's character who started off a little bit dark and then gets beautified by the end of the film. Speaking of The Breakfast Club, the Nancy, Jonathan, Steve triangle is obvious. Also add bitchin' and totally tubular to the kid's Valley Girl inspired vocabulary. But his brains are bad news. But he is a bitch and you really are so lucky, Dooley. When they go out on their mission, everybody gets a different mask and Eleven gets a really creepy baby mask. That's probably appeared in a few different places, but my favorite place it appeared is in Terry Gilliam's Brazil. Now there are two scenes that remind me of The Empire Strikes Back, and partially because in both cases Eleven is sort of going through training the way Luke Skywalker did on Dagobah with Yoda. In the first scene she has to move a train car with her powers, which is reminiscent of when Luke Skywalker had to use the force to lift his X-Wing out of the swamp. Later in the episode Kali forces Eleven to see a hallucination of Dr. Brenner, which is a callback to when Luke goes into the cave and faces Darth Vader. Chapter 8 is called The Mind Flayer, and this goes without saying. The Mind Flayer is an obvious D&D reference in a show built on them. Sure, Jurassic Park debuted in 1990, but it's not hard to find parallels in the power outage escape from the facility. Raptors and Demodogs, same thing. Mr. Hammond, I think we're back in business. <laughs> we know none of the kids want to be Winston for Halloween, but Lucas does a really good job channeling the Ghostbuster with this line. But if he does. Judgment Day. And the seas boiled and the skies fell. Judgment Day. Judgment Day. The whole sequence of sending Bob to restore the electrical power in the lab is basically a callback to when they send Bishop out to the antenna array to remote pilot a ship down to LV-426 in Aliens. And in just one more callback, the Hawkins lab uses the same alarm system we heard in Alien. The final chapter of season two features the most glaring influence when Will channels Linda Blair from The Exorcist. And yet again, another alien influence as Eleven is closing the gate on the Mind Flayer that looks exactly like a xenomorph. And the snowball dance is the long-awaited ending that Mike hoped for back in season one as he finally got to dance with Eleven. How cute. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I know we didn't hit every single Easter egg or 80s reference because it's damn near impossible and we don't have enough time to do all that, but let us know your favorites in the comments below. You can also hit us up on Twitter, our handles are in the description, and make sure to subscribe to Universe because we've got a lot more Stranger Things. There's a review, we've got some shocking moments coming up, and we cover a lot of other great stuff too. Hit us up, see you guys. Brought to you by The Evil Within 2. The Evil Within 2, available now.